So don't put your passwords on the screen, Lee. Hmm? <laughs> How many of you guys noticed that uh, Brazilian soccer command center <laughs> password was written on the whiteboard behind <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I missed that. Yeah. I mean, Passwords on a sticky note on the monitor is more it, secure than putting on the whiteboard up next to it, the screen. It made the news. They were talking about that for a good 10 minutes. How did I miss that? Good times. Anyone do anything fun today? Good. Uh, Stan, what did you fix? I didn't fix anything, but I downloaded uh, Kale, K A I L E, uh, Forensic uh, Distro. Oh, wait, wait, wait. That's um, Backtrack. Evolution, right? I believe so. Yeah, yeah. And, um, I'm more interested in if there's any documentation in those kind of things. Um, well, it's pretty fun. Um, I used Backtrack for a while, but then I switched over to doing everything on my raw machine, and I could get all the wireless passwords and minutes, and it was just completely awesome and completely illegal in some areas of the world. Um, the news of the day, uh, but um, Microsoft's laying off what, 18,000 people? You sure that was the news of the day? <laughs> <laughs> there were some other news in the world the day. Actually, the real news was um, Malaysian Airlines can't yes. seem to figure out how to keep a plane. Yeah, well, uh, that's twice in a short time. Both it, management issues. It was shot down. It was still management. The fact of flying over an area where uh, there are not going to be. Anti-aircraft missiles that can take down a U-2. So, so Stan, you're assuming that the other one wasn't shut down because they still can't find it. Okay. Well, the fact that they didn't—I mean, somebody pointed out that business jets have transponders that give their location. Obviously the not. <laughs> well, that wasn't a business jet. Okay. Um, so, so you're flying a private plane. You've got corporate vice presidents in it, and you. You're willing to spend a couple of thousand dollars to know where they are. So, does anyone know the nerd related news to the first Malaysian airline went missing? Uh, does anyone remember this? Did he had the uh, simulator in his house? He had a tactical simulator? No, no, no. The, the Malaysian airplane that went missing out over the Indian Ocean. Yeah. Right. The guy had a flight. Had flight all of Freescale's engineers on board. What? 20 of their Asian engineers were on board. Oh, no. <laughs> I haven't heard that. It was mm. Freescale. Freescale? Yeah. Um, you would know it's them just as making cool action. ARM processors and stuff? Mm. ARM processors? Like prosthetic ARM? No, no, no. No, no. no. Hey, yeah. ARM. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what that is. Um, yeah. X86 CPU? Uh-huh. Then you got ARMs. They're a little small. Like Android. Yeah. It's, 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 Android it's, it's, a, it's a, a risk Android. processor base, but redirected in a new way. Oh. So. It's actually the topic of this evening, so it's very topical. Oh, cool. Uh, but yeah, it was uh, interesting. The company came out and said they were instituting a new policy where no two, no uh, group of engineers could travel on the same form of transport. Mm -hmm. A little late. For the same unit of transport, or uh, they couldn't, they couldn't have all their eggs in one basket. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So when I was at Apple, they were talking about that. Are there stop or fly? Sorry? It looks just like the stock of where I work. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean it's a sheet of paper or oh oh downwards? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Stan, did you break anything today? Uh, no, I was uh, not into anything real technical today. Okay. Did anyone else fix something today? I helped Lee with the presentation. Okay. Or I tried. I found, oh, I did help. I found something he'd been searching for for months. Yeah, it was hidden, hidden under the table. I don't look down well. From was, my chair, I could see it. Actually, wonderful topic. Uh, Linus did an interview showing off his workspace today at his home. Oh, cool. And our desks are perfectly clean because you couldn't see his desk. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds boring. That shows he's normal. Right. But I mean, I, I watched that, and I realized he cleaned up a little bit for that. Oh, you can tell. <laughs> yeah. And I still couldn't see a desk in there anywhere. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't, you can't see a desk in, in the back cave because it's all around. Mm -hmm. Right. But it was it was nice to see 
a um, somewhat prevalent nerd <laughs> presents this. Let's see what other fun news there was. Um, so yeah, Microsoft was basically shaving off the rest of their Nokia developers. That Nokia was a huge employer in case I'm aware. And by huge, I mean really huge. Have any of you guys ever used Nokia's networking equipment? Never heard of it. So the Nokia networking arm is pretty prevalent in Asia. So it switches around and everything. I, I hate to put a big put up big news flash for you. Mm -hmm. it's no, I but sometimes sometimes you see stuff fall through eBay and such. It's actually reasonable hardware. Wow, I probably probably have a lot of them and I probably have like fifty of them. Four or five Nokia phones. Look, Sam's got the invincible one right here. Yeah, yeah, I understand where it is. They need to put that on the front of the police ram and try to take down the door. <laughs> <laughs> the door won't stand a chance. It's a great little phone. Mm -hmm. I can even figure it out. Sort of. <laughs> you know what's really neat? If you're in the Central African Republic or something, yeah. the back casing is flexible enough to hold three SIM cards. So if you go to a different valley, you can change your SIM card. Whoa. Really? Thanks, Dad. Um, I know if as they got more advanced, they seem to be deteriorating quality. Okay. I'm just jibber jabbering here, making sure we have plenty of time to get set up. And we're asking lots of fun and, questions and difficult questions as Lee talks about using the Raspberry Pi for, for fun and, and, and delicious recipes. Was that the terminology you used? Mm -hmm. That's delicious recipes. You can read it up there if you want. Ah! Stop using logic. <laughs> logic bad. Um, yeah, I am recording this. I'm going to throw it up on YouTube. Pretty much live streaming right now. Um, usually my mom watches this first. And she taught me how it went. So, but if you want to or you forget something, you can jump on there later and uh, craft a good thing. And we're trying to put all the episodes, all the uh, events up there so that you can uh, go back in time and <coughs> do stuff. How much control do you have over the main event? Complete control. You can't put the year and the date in there. Later on, big year and month. Well, all videos are tagged. Data by mail, but however, uh, I was thinking that we need to. I hope that's the air conditioning and not the same. Yeah. Clean the stuff out, get the But uh, no, that's a good idea. I'll uh, make a note of that. The what? Oh. No, 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 no. The air conditioning? Yeah. It's, it's atmosphere. Um, if nobody has anything they'd like to ask questions about, you know, normally we we'll warm up with a QA session. So if anyone has a specific Linux question, raise your hand, voice your opinion, ask for help. Do you need anything today? Or? Yeah, Amazon Web Services. Amazon Web Services. What do you want to know? Yeah. So to, to build a, is it possible to build HIPAA compliant? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's okay. Yes. What are the comments that you want to use for that? All okay, so basically in Google Compute Engine, Rackspace, Amazon, what they've basically done is say they say that every single service mm -hmm. they provide is covered by the compliance and auditing system. So you don't have to be a special case. Okay. Um for your DR compliance, there's exactly covered by compliance. You do have to be able to actually work with that's entirely on you. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, you can spin up services just like normal. Um, you okay. can optionally encrypt systems. Okay. Yeah, if you can get it, that would be a good So you're just basically trying to stand up some service in the wonderful, magical internet cloud and things. Looking at it as an option to, as a course, yeah. like Rackspace. So, so you can see if you go to Rackspace or something like that, they're going to give you the dedicated hardware. Yeah, but that still doesn't classify as. Um, so, for example, but here that's, a, that's a component of what they do for implied financial data. Correct. That's not sufficient. But they they consider it sort of like a necessary aspect. Of, you know, yeah, I I, that. I work on a particular employer in town, but we're recording right now, so I won't yeah. say much. Right. Um, 
But yeah, HIPAA compliance is just like the base level. You've got civil procedure law, you've got um, further uh, injury governmental agency won't share anything anymore. Because once it reaches a third party, that third party can be subpoenaed for it. So you get into a lot of fun stuff. And so you actually have to build an traceability into any interchange you do. And it's really going. For HIPAA? Uh, for any type of medical data now. It's no longer just HIPAA. Okay. So each state might have a law that tax on top of it. <clears throat> so if you have the medical records of a state employee, period, you have to follow the state level, the federal level, and the HIPAA also. Because HIPAA's IT statement is what, like five paragraphs? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty small. Yeah, yeah privacy. It's, it's basically just... In reality, it's just like gap accounting. Audit and prove who had it when. Chain of trust, chain of uh, custody type stuff. Is there any simple way to set that up? Simple way to set that up? I mean, is there any uh, documentation that would outline some requirements for different venues or, or yeah, yeah, it's actually not that hard. It's just like you know, if you had like a MySQL database, you can basically turn on logging for every query. Okay. And at that point, you do have that information. But then you have a ton of logs that you don't know what to do with. So then the, then the issue becomes archiving them where you can refer to Yes. So, so just a simple application with you know some type of personal information, which is you know, HIPAA. And then whenever it comes you know PHI or actual medical information, then it gets to a level where you know, you're logging everything. Okay, can I make a suggestion? Yeah. I, I think Bill and I have similar interests. Uh, I'm working with a startup that's looking for ways to manage that process. I'm, I'm assuming that might be something that's interesting to do. Can we, I'm not sure how we make it, you know, I'm not sure if it, if it might be too, our, too off, off topic for people, but would anybody like to see that kind of stuff in a presentation? No. <laughs> anybody? <laughs> So, so in, in the reality of it, the absolute reality of it is, is cranking up your logging. You got an Apache web server, okay? Cranking up your your logging to basically, you know, record everything. And it's more about the audit ability than it is the actual access. That's the reality of it. Okay. No, but yet, yeah. then, if, then if you've got, you know, a gig of logs, the you know, stuff stuff from somewhere every day, what do you do? Yeah. That's the thing. So, for example, a project like um, Octopussy, that's its real name. There's a, a project just, it's basically an open source plunk is what it is. And you can pass stuff through it all day long. And it will let you jump in there and a user, a secretary, can jump in on this interface and find a time, time period and find everything that happened with a particular, you know, IP or whatever they want. And that's an open source project? Yeah, Octopussy. Yeah, it thinks it has to be encrypted at rest. They have to be encrypted in transport. Right. right. Yeah. And, and but and since SSL <laughs> satisfies that, it's actually so easy. Yeah. But one of the problems that um, I don't know who has had them um, is that a lot of caching systems and a lot of databases they have the SSL capability, but the users don't normally use it, mm -hmm. so the documentation normally just sucks. So, for example, getting MySQL cluster up, set up using a uh, pre-shared key is secure. But the documentation for how to set that up is pretty much lacking because people don't do it. They set up a private network for their database clusters, and they don't even think about it. So, for example, on Amazon, you can create a little private backbone network, and it never sees the light of day. Yeah, you know, like, for example, how, how do you store the private keys for your encrypted volume, this volume? Um, well, the Ansible would be a great solution for that. You can use your vault and push them out there. Um, there are, you can use a PKI system. You know, there's a lot of solutions for that. And it has to be encrypted during transport. Yeah. That doesn't mean that your key needs to be a public SSL key. It can be a private CA you run internally. Just as long as if you can open up TCP, TCP dump or Wireshark, all you see is gibberish. You don't see... John Smith is 36 years old, blah, 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 blah. Okay. We don't need to take any more time. Yeah, 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 y
I don't want to spend more money than we need to. I just, but I don't want to spend less money than we need to either, right? So we got to try yeah. to optimize. The, the, the if you question. if you grab one of these things and just basically start drawing it out, yeah. it is pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. It's just you get down and like you configure your database for SSL security once, and then you just replicate that. Okay. I don't know what size of app you're talking. About. You're talking about yeah. something small proof of concept, or at this point, yeah, but we're gonna, yeah, it's going to launch and then start a, a hundred gigabytes per second. <coughs> grow from there. Hmm? Yeah, it's a, it's a so it's an application for it, it's a trust network for physicians, mm -hmm. uh, which is a way to leverage uh, social media marketing for physicians. So it, it allows doctors to sort of have their patients. There's like there's, there are surveys involved and things of that sort, but the, uh, patients can answer a net promoter question, you know, would you recommend your doctor to your friends? And if they say yes, then they get an option to kind of push this ad that we build of the doctor onto their, either their Facebook page or their Twitter page, and then they get another net promoter question about do they like the service that we're providing. And if they say yes, then they get an option to push an ad for the service out to their, again, their Facebook and Twitter page. And then so you're building yeah, an interface for too. medical salesmen to really get in the door, huh? Well, the, right. The, one of the revenue streams is for ads. And so, yeah, the, I mean, the network builds a uh, hey, hey, in, information. Instead of taking any more time here. No, yeah, you're, sure, you're, we could do you it. You guys are actually I'll fine. Well, we, we, we normally kind of we're going to start at 7.30ish, yeah, and, and, and this yeah. is a very good topic for a few of us, but not yeah. all of us. So right. what I can say is <clears> I know there's at least one or more startups that I'm working with interested in HIPAA compliant at some point. Um, yes, yeah, so maybe we can get together. Well, what, what I'm saying is maybe we can put together some sort of, uh, not to, you know, maybe I think and sponsor some sort of, uh, you know, mini seminar where, where we can draft Andrew to come in yeah. and and for the technical right. point. But, okay, so HIPAA is kind of like the the Constitution of the amendments. It's it reads fine, and if you you know, if you do sit down and read it, it does track pretty far. Well, but but the point is, PCI is kind of similar, but there's a whole checklist is 25 items long mm -hmm. that you go through to establish it. Yeah, and you right. need to spend what you need to spend, but you don't want to spend more than you need so, to spend. Okay, so, so that's, for, that's the issue, is okay. what exactly do we need to do? I mean, so yeah, yeah we can move on. No, 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 I, I, no. I will address I that one real quick. Forward, but PCI, DOD, yeah. all that stuff is actually rather decent. You have the National Institute of Technology, National Institute of Science and Technology, NIST, and they have tool chains out there for Unix and Windows, etc., to prove that your systems are compliant. So you can do PCI compliance for free. You know, you just basically download this tool chain, run it against your system, it tells you where you are, what needs to be addressed, what's what's not good, what's good. Would that satisfy yeah. the, the I mean, public side of HIPAA? Um, well, see, HIP is just auditing. It's not actually technical. Well, but there's got to be a technical component there somewhere that that, that says yeah. your your web server has to be not, not be vulnerable to attack. That is very little, if any, technical. It's basically it was written for paper records. Okay. Yeah, and it to the point where it's scary. You want to run away after reading it. It's built for paper records. Okay. There are plenty of other examples of that. So yeah, a lot of these documents, don't be scared. I mean, it's like the license agreement for Apple is scarier than the HIPAA document. Mm -hmm. I saw an item about um, military uh, medals being requested and awarded. And apparently the process is someone emails the request into one of, part of the office to do it. They print it out. Mm -hmm to be examined by the superior officer who then signs off on it. Then it gets scanned back in and emailed to the next person who prints it out, examine it by hand. So it's not uncommon for such metal requests to be lost, or it can happen. Also, when they scan it in, they have to shred it afterwards. Right, but and, and don't think of it so much as that the request was lost. Think of it more of that person went on vacation and gotten a deadly accident. No. <laughs> there are more ways of things getting lost yeah. than just the paper sliding off the desk. There yeah. are, you know, 
immense number of ways of things just getting lost. And that traceability is something that the digital age gives us. Mm -hmm. Which they're not using. Well, it's scary, you know. There goes my job. Mm -hmm. Oh, if, if they. And, yeah. How many of you guys have heard that uh, automation will take away my job? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's always going to be mine. What? It's always going to be mine. Oh. Paperless office, right? You know what a paperless office is? I'm sure you do. <laughs> it's an office without a printer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Of course, there's the question of the paradigm of a lot of people take their paper process and just do it electronically instead of actually adjusting the process to work well. Well, yeah, I, I, I have worked on uh, ERP systems, and I co-authored a popular piece of software code, OpenERP, it's now called Voodoo, is a name change to uh, deal with some confusion. <laughs> um, but we pretty much battle nerds, you know, nerds, young nerds, battling business process management, EPM. And everybody's, you know, telling us this is how it works, and we're like, you know what? No. It can be simpler. And our first first stable release of this software that did everything in an enterprise was uh, about three megabytes of Python code, and two megabytes of that was translations. So a lot of this stuff is actually not that hard. In business process management is special. Um, it's just a UML document. You guys remember UML, right? Woohoo! If you guys are out of fun topics, nothing else I should have to take it. Well, one quickie. I brought some sodas over there. Oh, from. we brought sodas so that you will enjoy this presentation more. And I, There's I, a kitchen right over that way. And I actually found some ice in the right-hand fridge, if it's okay to steal some. I guess. <laughs> okay. There's a mental health institute up here now, so it could be theirs. They might go crazy if you take their eyes. The ice maker's maker broken. Oh. I, I, I'd like to say, uh, you know, we really do appreciate you still letting us be here. And I'm really uh, pleased to see some people around here. Yeah. Likewise. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want us to just come out, hang out on random days so it looks like you're busy or what? That could be good. Yeah, if you want to, there's a lot of good looking women here now. Yeah. You might want to. <laughs> <laughs> but what what kind of companies are you tracking? I mean, well, so MIMA just took like a, I don't know over fifteen thousand square feet. Who was this now? Missouri Institute for Mental Health. It's oh, actually really? part of the U University of Missouri. Uh, Omsel, part of okay. Omsel. Yeah, but they moved in. Yeah, since the year last meeting, right? Yeah. Okay. So they're here. So you know a lot of crazy people around here. Yeah, yeah they're good people. No model in school, so. <laughs> Not yet. We we'll work on that. That's a good idea. I think you guys are. Serious. I think you guys are staring at the women you can't afford. You better be careful. Yeah. Yeah. Staring at what? The women you can't afford. Um, <laughs> well, nothing wrong with staring. So what? What else is in the news today besides Microsoft? Lots of depressing stuff. Uh, the St. Louis Zoo got a baby zebra or something. That was the. Only positive news I found. <laughs> it's pretty bad when you're like clamoring to find something positive to make your day not, you know, a total drag. Yeah. Um, I did bring a toy in case Lee runs out of time. I brought a Beagle Bone Black Revision sleeve. I did announce uh, yesterday lunch that I finally got Distro Watch. Uh, distro Watch. Uh, Burning that system has to be back up in the top 100. My efforts have paid off. Are you like like one of five people that's competing with everything? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Actually, uh, good news was uh, Sony Entertainment Online or Sony Online Entertainment. Did you guys hear this news? Did they go to five guys? Uh, Sony. Uh, re oh, oh, they they yeah. Sony kind of forgot to renew their domain name oh, <laughs> for the domain that had the name servers for all of their services for online play PS4 games. They failed to pay 
pay, pay the bill for like three or four weeks or something? Yeah, it, they, it basically lasts for, uh, I think they, in the article they said like a number of days. Um, and yeah. it took Sony, it was like over 24 hours to get it resolved. That, the notice is that a squad already bought it by the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Sold it back to Sony for like half a million. No, I, I think the, the registrar. I think they oh, yeah, kind of yeah. kept it anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, hey, the registrar legally has to keep it for 30 days after it expires. Yeah. But so it's about right. 30 days renewed after. Yeah, it they they basically Chris got a nice paycheck out of this one. Oh, you wanted that domain back? <laughs> <laughs> A special deal just for you. Speaking of your domains, what's your take on Microsoft versus no IP? Oh, wow. um, so Microsoft thinks that they are policing the world by removing malware websites. But in fact, they could just fix their software. <laughs> no IP's side of the story was if they had been told to take down those addresses, they would have done it. It's like twenty thousand or so out of millions that they. But it's 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 probably it's probably some manager at Microsoft wanted to to um, show everyone the power in his pants. If you know. Well, I, mean. I read one article that said Microsoft didn't want to tell them because they didn't want to alert the spammers. Why would tell them? But, but Hotmail is the biggest it's spammer it's on the planet. Why would they care about alerting? Well, now don't confuse that. <laughs> No, you said Microsoft just needs to fix their software. The thing is, their DNS software then was so broken it couldn't handle the traffic that they were taking over. Yes, their BSD software they stole in the 90s and never bothered to merge in the patches. Yeah, fast stuff. Well, that's the, oh, but they also didn't scale it big enough. Or well, it wasn't when they stole it, it. It was you know 30 years ago. So. Oh, well, okay. Lots happened. No, DNS is literally only 30 years old. This last year, 19, uh, 1982 was DNS. But apart from not merging in the patches, um, would it run be better if they put it on bigger hardware? Would it run Windows, Windows doesn't run really good on any hardware. This is BSD. <laughs> no, they're, no, they're using the BSD services on a Windows machine. Oh, machine. they were trying to do no IP's job with a Windows machine? Yeah, of oh. course. Yeah. Oh, but Microsoft doesn't use anything except Windows, no matter what stolen software they run on. Right. At least if they can make the conversion from what they required. But but beyond the Microsoft bashing, basically big companies stretching power where it wasn't needed and creating some bad publicity for themselves, but that doesn't matter because they've got plenty of bad publicity. They have a brand that people don't respect. You can't be fired. So, you can't be fired for buying. So if you are a company like No IP and you have a reasonably successful product, divide and conquer. Create a new company that has the exact same product. Mitigate your losses. You mean so one will be acquired by Microsoft? Speaking of which, I don't know if I ever asked you the question. Why hasn't somebody successfully re or reverse engineered Mappy yet? Uh, Mappy has been reverse engineered several times. Clean room, open exchange .net is a clean room Sir, implementation. I'm, I'm a client. The the client. Yeah, replace Outlook and do, and do Mappy so you can do it with you know run your Windows apps in uh, Line or, or VM and I I boy I don't know that anyone's done a client. I know that. Um, Several VoIP companies have a client for address inter integration and calendar integration for hard phones on desk and for soft phones. So, like you have a soft SIP phone, mm -hmm. they, there are some integration clients. I don't know about open source ones, though. That's a good question. Yeah, I just want to throw it out there since we're talking about Microsoft. Because I mean, my iPad does Outlook. Say again? It, well, it, it talks to Exchange server, right? Yeah, but that's probably OWA, though, not Mappy. It's Outlook Web Access. And no, Mappy, I, I, Mappy is for software that interfaces to Outlook to send email from a client. Oh, client. It, it, it's 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 a it's right. a Microsoft API Mappy or whatever. Blah blah blah. Mail API. Yeah. Mail API, but it has a calendaring feature, the address book feature, and it's very locked down by 
quote unquote licensed and blah blah blah, patented blah blah blah. Yeah. I mean, so, there there there's a bunch of open source server products out there that support exchange, the exchange interface in various forms. But the MAPI is what I understand the client side. So if you've yeah. got Outlook on your machine and you run ACT, ACT can hook to Outlook and look at the calendar and send email and stuff like that. Yeah, and I, I mean it's all CalDAV, WebDAV, all that stuff kind of works. So I don't know if that that's a big issue. Yeah, you know, the, the reason I ask there's been more than once where we've had to throw out the Linux server or, or, or put in a Windows VM on a Linux server because they want MAPI. Or, and or for desktop, we have to use Windows because you can't do MAPI anywhere else. And like Peachtree and some of the big name softwares like that, you can't run them. I wonder if in it, I wonder if Open Exchange has a like a MAPI to uh, CalDAV, MAPI to WebDAV stuff because the address book comes over WebDAV. Yeah, but how? What would you use for client? You could use anything from the client if it was touching CalDAV. No, what I'm saying is you need something to replace Outlook on the local machine. Yeah. That's that's outside of my okay. Anyway, my uh, my realm. Okay, well we're going to let Lee get started here, and he's going to tell us some uh, delicious recipes about how to tweet on your pie and and to do other fun things like scratch your back and things. And uh, I will hand it away. Should I? <clears throat> uh, I think we we talked about pie about a year and a half ago. I think it was, and I've been doing a lot of stuff with them since then. Uh, you know, I actually got a commercial product where I find somebody, some, find somebody to buy the service where I take a pie, put it in a little, little red case hanging on the wall with a camera, and it's a Nagio server. So I can monitor your, any, any machine in your server room as well as give you a picture from out the server room from anywhere in the world. Assuming you have light, a little bit, you, assuming you have some lighting. My problem is my server rooms are all dark. So unless there's somebody in them, you don't see anything. But, but if you had lighting in the server room. But anyway, you know, we talked about it before. It's a very functional product. Uh, there's a couple main advantages to it. There's tons of micro micro boards out there. Uh, everything from Beagle board, like Andrew had, it's it's more powerful than a Pi, but it has nowhere near the market share. The the beauty of a Pi is it runs a standard kernel, not like the Arduino or other microcontrollers where you have to write your program, download it, do it, run a program. The Pi runs a standard Linux kernel. There's many of them out there. There's there's Debian's and Raspbian's. There's Arch. I'll show you an Arch. Uh, there's you know at least five or six that have an ARM version. But but the standard kernel. The other big advantage to a Pi, which I like, is it's a standard form factor, and you can find a hundred vendors that make cases for them. Some of them are crap. <laughs> Pardon my French. <laughs> I, I snapped the top on this case and couldn't get a power cord in it. Power cord won't, won't hit it. That one I happened I happened to drop on the table and it exploded. So I just held, held together with scotch tape. <coughs> there is a manufacturer that I use for server room monitors called Syntech, C Y N T E C H, and they make a great little plastic case that goes together with four screws on the back. I figured out where to mount the camera in there. I drill a hole in the front, hot glue the camera in, and it makes a real nice package. But it's opaque, so it would be hard to pass it around. True. You can't see what's in it. But then you don't necessarily want a customer to see what's in it if it's hanging on the wall. Uh, so anyway, you know, pies are very useful from that standpoint. They're not the most powerful machine out there. There are two, two new versions of the pie to think about. What I use is the Model B. has half a gig of memory. You know, standard standard interfaces. Last year, a Pi compute engine came out. Uh, it's designed to be run embedded. You stick it in the was it? A, I don't remember what the slot is. Slot. Hmm? It's just slot. it's a mini PCI, is what it is. Okay, it's a SIM slot. Yeah, it, it's yeah, like a RAM. Right, like a RAM slot. Like a RAM. Yeah, it's a standard mini PCI. Yeah. I'm not even sure what application you have for it. Uh, I, can, um, so there are. Card banks where you can just like snap 20 of them in. Okay, so basically run it, make build an array out of. Okay. And then uh, just just recently here, I think last month it came out with a B plus. Uh, I haven't looked at it too much. It's a it's a new version. In fact, here it is. Okay. 
Not quite as far as the A minus. The B plus. Exactly. They're available for microsecond. Oh, was the plus it now? Yes. The A minus is? Or the A minus The A minus is? No, the A minus and the B plus. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. 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 How do I throw something? I thought I could just slide it on the desktop. Well, how do you have your desktop area? Left and right? I mean, you can see me slide. Well, a lot of speculation was there that the B plus name was so the C product would not get interrupted. I think it's going to be a B. D? I like right. B. Anyway, it's, it's, it's B plus. <laughs> oh, there it is. That's, that's it there. Uh, hardware porn. Yep. Mm -hmm. it, it has a bigger GPIO header. You've got more IO pins on it. It has four USB ports instead of two. And it got rid of the old composite video app. The composite video is in the audio jack now. Yeah, so it's a four. So where's the audio? Four no, no, it's a four conductor. Oh, it's jack. a four conductor. Yeah. Okay. Good luck on finding that plug, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen them in the, you know, connected. They're like camcorders. It's like you, you buy a camcorder and you get a micro, micro SD. Okay. Yeah. But, but my, my reason, the other reason for using the B is the camera. Mm -hmm. The camera's 25 bucks. You plug it in the card. Yeah, and that has a camera plug still, too. It does? Yeah. But different? Yeah, one next. It's the exact same camera yeah. plug. Oh. Okay. It doesn't look like it though. Yeah, it, no, the the so this camera plug was normally in the middle. I'm sorry, I'm saying it's bigger over. than the normal camera plug. I'm sorry? There's more than one connector on five. I'm yeah, the second one's back here. Okay. Yeah, they're both there. And you can click right here and it might help. Because it helps by turn on JavaScript. There you go. So here's your your camera interface for the exact same port. No, I'm saying it looks too big. Right, anyway, I'll take your word for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See you there. Mm -hmm. There's the camera on here. I guess it does at the same size. I'm sorry. I, I should have brought some extras for you to pass around. Well, I got one going. Or mounting holes, man. Uh, we, yeah, the, the mounting holes are um, taking a lead off of just basically a lot of people like Lee just complained about the case. You know, a lot of people were getting really crappy cases that were bending and snapping. Yeah, but that's why I like to send them. Anyway, uh, this Spark Fun site here is where I got, I got a lot of material for tonight. They've got videos, they've got tutorials, they sell all kinds of stuff. Uh, it's, it's a pretty neat site if you want to build something. Now they've probably got 50 Pi projects on there that could be useful, plus all kinds of other stuff. Yeah, see, that? there's the B plus, and there's the B. By the way, Newark sells them for 35 bucks. They're the only distributor in the country. So they're, they're part. Of, they are part of Element 14. Which is the only licensed U.S. distributor? Can you see in electronics? Hmm? Can you see in electronics? Hasn't it? I mean, you can get them anywhere, but Newark is the only place you get them at 35 bucks. Can you see in electronics? Hasn't it? Well, then, the way I understood it, Element 14 was the only licensed distributor in the U.S., and they're the only ones that can sell them at, at 35. If they're selling for 35, it's either Lost Leader or you know, they cut another deal for them. 29.95. At where? Yeah. How can they sell them less than? Because they're trying to get people to buy the accessories. So, so they're taking a $5 hit on it. And it's they the just restocked yeah. it and they probably have 100 Yeah, they're selling them at a loss. Yeah, and it's an $11 case right next to it. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> Until it snaps in pieces. And a power supply. And well, the Syntex are only 11 bucks, and, and they're made out of poly polyethylene. Which means you can hit them with a hammer, no bounce. Adafruit has a case made out of cardboard. 
They have one made out of wood, cardboard, layered plastic. Layered plastic ones like indestructible or something. Yeah. The cardboard they have them made out of aluminum. The cardboard was like five bucks. Yeah. It comes in pieces. You have to assemble it. Yeah. It's it's the same thing with that plastic one. It's it's layers. It's yeah. like it's like twenty layers of cardboard. You have to like stack them all up. <laughs> and glue them. No thanks. Uh, if, 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 if the Syntec, eleven dollars, Chicago elect, electronic distributor, CED. They're injection molded. They're they're bulletproof, and or not bulletproof, but they're very very hardy. <laughs> but you can also get a uh, cover for the SD card. So you put so you put the SD card in. You put the the little cover in there. You bolt it together. There's nothing nothing accessible except the plug. Anyway. There's three. Okay. Hello. So besides the additional two USB ports and now the combined audio composite port, is there so other advantages to yes. the plus? So, for example, one of the advantages was moving all of the I.O. to be in line with each other. So, for example, the network jack is in set and the USB is out set here. So all the the interfaces are in a straight line and the interfaces are only on two sides. So some people refer to it as the Pi Octopus because when it's on the desk and everything's plugged in, it's like uh, a creature. Mm -hmm. um, and then the micro SD was basically the other feature because it has a micro SD card holder now. The, the entire card goes inside the little clicky holder, and so there's no more sticking out of anything. But you, on the Raspberry Pi, though, you can get what's called a half card, mm -hmm. and you, it's like a little tiny SD card so which you can SD stick adapter. the micro SD yeah. in sideways, and it's really trim. Mm -hmm. I, I, I actually used one of those for uh, an octo print. Raspberry Pi app hooked up 3D printer. So. Okay. I need, sorry, I need to practice with this projector more. I was, Steve was talking about last night talking about the hummingbird. Uh, is that? Oh, the similar layout to the. Well, there's the banana, the humming. There's a whole bunch of them. Have you seen the banana board? No, I haven't. It's basically a. There's one from China, I think. Yeah, it, it's it's an altered Raspberry Pi design. Is it yeah. ARM six or ARM seven? Um, it had a whole bunch of different features. I don't even remember them all. Yeah. You know what? What what one of the minor issues with the Pi is it's still ARM six. I don't know if it computes ARM7 or whatever. Yeah. You know, so so it is a little bit old. So when you go down the list of supported devices, you got Raspberry Pi at ARM6 and you got 50 on at ARM7. Yeah. But for the design purpose and the price point they're hitting, it's yeah. actually yeah. a pretty good deal. But well, I mean, still 35 bucks or yeah. I think maybe I ought to get some at Micro Center. Although I don't know, we'll have to see what kind of cases come out. Anyway, tonight I'll show you how to tweet your Pi. I'll show you how to connect your Pi to your Twitter account, which is an adventure in itself since the first time I tried to do it. How many of you guys know what Twitter is? I don't you think really know what Twitter is. <laughs> how many of you use it on a regular basis? Well, if they don't know what it is, I would not expect them to be using it much. <laughs> <laughs> I know some people like it. Does anybody look at Twitter more than once once a week? I see where CDC uses Twitter to, to map. Um, disease outbreaks. Could be all centered on. Now the that's CDC using Twitter. Mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're centered on the CDC anymore. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, uh, I'll show you how to tweet your Pi. Make the Pi a tweet <clears throat> engine. Uh, obviously, uh, I, will, I will get to the point that I can put a message up there for you. But if you want to. Do anything with it. All you have to do is push a string into the little Python program I'll show you, and you can tweet it. Or, exercise for you: connect it to your Gmail account with uh, Sassel, so you can log in on, on a secure link, and you can get Gmail the same. 
Why would you not use a pie to send email? You mean as your SMTP? Yeah, as your SMTP server. Well, A, you probably don't have a static IP. B, you don't have reverse DNS. Three, you probably don't have an SPF record. And four, nobody's going to accept your email unless they're Microsoft. Or just configure smart hubs stuff. Well, yeah, use, as I say, use Gmail for smart hubs. Or use an internal internal relay for your internal email server for your relay. But it's pretty slick, it's pretty easy. We'll talk about, I'll show you a way to monitor the Twitterverse. And I'll also talk about some penetration testing. Although I will admit the damn install blew up this afternoon. I didn't have time to redo it. Spent an hour and a half downloading seven gig worth of packages for archassault.org, only to only to have a choke at the end when it says corrupt package. Mm -hmm. I didn't buy it. I didn't have time to troubleshoot it. So let's start off with tweeting your pie. Basically, we're in an SD card. I recommend Raspbian. A, it's simple. B, it has all the drivers you need for GPIO. C, it's based on Debian, so most, most people are probably familiar with it. Use Aptitude or AppKit all day long to configure it the way you want. It's right there on <coughs> Raspberry Pi and dot downloads. Uh, there is more than one flavor there. There is a newbie version, NWOB version. Uh, I've never looked at it. I can't say what's better about it. I, right below that is the Raspbian version, and there's a Pydora, uh, and there's some others. Once you get it, Anybody not familiar with DDing it to a SD card? What's what's the trick? Sorry. I well, said if you set your byte size, it'll go faster and smoother. Set it which way? Set I've, I've, I've tried default. It's what 256k. I've tried one meg. I've tried four meg. It's all about the same. Yeah. Just use CAD. Hmm? Just use CAD. Well, the um, there are a lot of different card readers out there. Some of them are uh, different speeds and different technologies. Yeah, it could be USB 2 versus USB 3. No, not, not that speed. I mean the uh, speed. The actual reader speed. Yeah, the SDHC, SDHC Plus, yeah. all that stuff. I mean. Anyway, it, it's, it's simpler not to worry about. Just walk away, come back in half an hour, it'll be done. Uh, although the point, I was, the point I was getting to is it can be an issue finding it. How, how do you know? How do you know what the drive letter is? So SD, SD on my machines always comes up SDF. You can assume that. Uh, if you're running a, a Linux GUI, a lot of times it'll auto mount. And it, depending on how you write it, uh, if I use SUSE Image Writer, I have to unmount it. But if you DD it, it doesn't care. It'll write right over a mounted file system. I usually check and just wait until the system's up and running. As soon as I plug it in, then I just do a tail on D message. Tail on D message or F just by itself. Last thing that shows up is where it's yep. trying to mount. Once you do that, though, most of the Pi images I've seen come in around 2 gig. So if you need more space, <clears throat> it can be an issue. You need to get it. When you start the Raspberry Pi, I'll show you here in a few minutes, uh, there's a menu that comes up, Raspberry Config, and you can just tell it, expand the fill, expand the, fit, the, the physical partition. I did find out today, playing with Arch Linux, it, that can be a little bit of an issue. Because FDISC, it took me about half an hour to use parted and FDISC to actually uh, back up. The third thing I'm going to I built was Arch Arch Linux, Arch Assault Linux, which was the pen test version of Arch Linux on Pi for ARM. And the base image was 1.9 gig, as you expect. 
but there's no slick utility on her to expand it like the rasp like Raspbian has. Unfortunately, when it built it, it built a Windows 95 boot partition, a logical F disk partition, and uh, uh, Strong and the partition file. Parted would not expand it. I had to use parted to expand partition 2, which was the logical container, to 30 gig. Then I had to use FDIS to expand partition 5 to 30 gig. And then uh, ext, ext2fs extended file system to actually blow the ext4 partition out there. The file system out of the partition size. It took me a long time to figure out. Anyway, another trick that I, or another thing I do when I do a production machine, I take an 8 gig SD card and I manually expand the base partition to 4 gig. And then I can run an arcing job in the background once a night to set up that second partition as a you know, format of the AXC4, mount it. At one o'clock in the morning, back up the system, and I'm not. You know, that way, if the system foes, I can all I can get to it manually in most cases, and I've got a, a R snapshot back up there with versioning for all my config files now. Any questions on building an SD card? How many people have done it? It's not, it's not that bad. Uh, most notebooks nowadays come with SD slots you can use. Or if you if you get a if you have a camera with an SD card, a lot of times you can get a chip with a USB reader, which is what I use on my desktop system. I plug the SD chip into the reader and drop it in the USB port. The hard part of this process for me was setting up the damn Twitter Twitter account. <laughs> So, okay, I do have a Twitter account. I use it maybe, I look at it maybe once a month. Or if I'm bored, I'll pull it up on my cell phone. But you can't have an app write to your Twitter unless you have a cell phone on your account. Kind of dumb. Oh, and um, you have to have a recognized provider to have your cell phone. Your no, it turns out that was, that was my phone. Oh, okay. Uh, it, it asked you for your Twitter ID on the phone. I didn't realize you had to put an at sign in front of it. Oh. So when you confirm it on your phone, you have to get, you have to use the at sign. Okay, where's my browser here? First the computer. Yeah, it doesn't. It's not sure what app you want to deal with. Right? You have to select that guy again. Oh, that, that's your active application. Yeah. You're in app select mode. So. I can't select it. I can't select anything. Can you click in the middle there? Nothing. Okay. What do I do? Huh? What do I do? Well, you trick it, of course. Ah, trick uh, it. Could, <laughs> control, control Alt F1, for example. Log in and see what's stealing you. NSCP. Okay. Everything looks fine. Alt F7, get back there. And Except now I don't have any screen. Huh? 
Give it a moment. It's got to catch up with you. No, I got a black screen on my desktop. Uh, alt F6 or Alt F8 for uh, multiple consoles. No. No, it's, it's on F7. Yeah, it is F7, but mm -hmm. black screen with a mouse. Okay, just unplug the projector from your computer there real quick and see if you see if your computer wakes up. No, nope, it's closed. Is there a way to get out of app select mode? Is it still on there on your screen or what? No, all I got is a black screen and a mouse. We're seeing flashes of light and hearing Gary go, Hoop. Mm -hmm. Well, it killed this way. Yeah. Besides this. Uh, the primary purpose was for a learning computer for children, so in a classroom environment, so that you can, you know, the base model was twenty-five dollars, so you could buy twenty-five dollar computer to a whole bunch of kids. And because it has HDMI, it can do full HD video, so you can. It's basically a computer, full-blown computer, not terribly quick, but terribly fast. To expand on what he said was, you know, they that was the answer to the question of, well, if you do this problem at home on your computer or whatever to some 12 year old kid, he says, well, I can't, but my parents won't let me, they think I'll break it. So somebody says, well, can't somebody come up with a cheap little computer? And so that was their goal. You know, that's why they use HDMI, and so they didn't have five monitors, they could use the TV. They use that USB, micro USB connector. They buy these El Chico chargers for, for a cell phone for your power supply. And, you know, get a USB keyboard and plug it in and whatever makes it easier. So this is the entry level one laptop per child. This is the one computer per child. Will it run a full blown Linux image with a GUI and everything? Correct, yes, yes. it does. Oh, okay. so, so I thought it was. It's, <laughs> it's actually oh. not that slow, yeah, it's depending on what yeah. you run. Right. Uh, Quake is a little iffy. <laughs> Quake. <laughs> but uh, no, there's a, there's a magazine by the name of Magpie, and they actually lay out the design, the text, and everything for every issue of their magazine on a Raspberry Pi. So it can be it can be pretty reasonably powerful. All right, Dave, thanks. Um, as discussed, they were under thirty bucks at Micro Center. Of course, tax and everything will probably get back at thirty-five bucks or something close. Yeah. Um, they're great. They're pretty indestructible. Um, you know, you can get a case for them, but modern fourteen-layer PCB is waterproof as as close to this. As close as you can get. Um, Lee's booting a Pi up here right now on the screen. He's got a keyboard, and somewhere I think there's a mouse. There's a mouse right there. Yeah, it'll tilt it. Using for like a 
hold the protector back on. I, I'll get it. I'll get it. Actually, it's full HDMI, so you're going to have to shrink a little. It's, okay. leave, leave where it was. You're going to have to shrink it a little because now it's going. I was moving it for a separate reason. Oh, okay. Well, that's crooked. That's crooked. Straight on. Uh-uh. have a keystone adjustment. Well, Netflix. Anyway, this is a pie. I may suggest. Can you guys read that in the back? No, no you don't have to. No. <laughs> <laughs> you want to get the lights at my help? How about if we move that back? He's got. He has the GUI up. We'll start the GUI. That's not. We don't go ahead and turn it on. Nope. <laughs> this is the question from the, the, the question from the back was, does it run a GUI? Oh, cool. The question from the peanut gallery. So I, you want to open a random app, app and see? Well, I'm going to put it up on a Wi-Fi. Oh, there you go. Yeah, you can't get any bigger, can you? Oh, you, you just want a huge one. Big screen. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the icons off there on the left, and I'll run. Because you probably have a U.S. you probably have a USB connector on the TV, so you just plug the Pi into that. It runs off of the TV, so you don't even need extra cords at all. All you need is the HDMI cable to go from the strongest gas. The top one, the top one there, you're going to need that. Yeah, the T plus. Basically includes everything about the design makes it good. Uh, okay. Your PSK is here. There it is. That's uh, I'm mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, both Right. And guess goes down here. No. That's an optional setting. So where's the username? Oh, never mind. Oh, it's Umzel. Umzel guess. Um, yeah, you have an SLG. Yes, Why am I not getting an IP address? Five needed a power connector. Well, Why am I not getting an IP address? I have. I don't know. I see an IP address. There we go. There we go. And then USB connector for the mouse. Okay. But you don't have to use it. Power has to run the microphone. Yes. Okay. Actually, did. So is this Raspbian record? Yep. Just draw the yeah. Well, this is Raspbian. <coughs> if if you're doing basic play on a on a Pi, I recommend Raspbian or Nubi. You know, if you're going to let your kid put Nubi on there, if you're going to use it, Raspbian's fine. It has X windows if you need the GUI. That's the simplest way to configure the Wi-Fi on this thing, you know, with the, the wireless app. Uh, it is just a little, you know, thumb size USB wireless on here. Who's the noise? I am. I'll try to figure out how to make it silent. Oh, there it is. Now it's silent. Okay, over here on the right, you go to My Applications. Everybody see that? Oh, crap. 
I'm trying to. Uber and the app sign. That's interesting. I can't get that sign out of this damn thing. Two. You've got languages English UK. Is that do you think that's affecting the keyboard map? Yeah, um, it probably is. Yeah. We're at US and Asia. Typing random characters and see if you can find the answer. Yes and... I did find out something interesting when I was trying to do my phone this afternoon. Twitter does not publish SPF records for their, uh, you know, and just in their text records. Come on. Okay, here's the app I created. Create the new app if you need one. Now here's the here's the key part. There are four things you need. You need the API key. Show you where they go here in a second. Let's go out to the terminal. And yeah. make this a little bigger. Yeah, I get a little six feet. <laughs> Wrong card? I don't know. Yeah, we can make you it. You got a Pi directory there, is that it? No. Well, the Pi is the only user. I think he's expecting another. I was user. expecting an LVL user. Some magic up here. Where 
Hey Don, mm -hmm. show them around the new buoy for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. I'm make another copy of the program over there. Have a mouse. I know. Yeah. <laughs> we have to do it. Do it again. Uncover <laughs> that IP. Don, uncover that IP for a second before you go away. Do what? Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. <laughs> Idle is an IDE, an integrated development environment. For Python. Correct. Uh, Monty Python, Eric Idle. Oops. <laughs> it's a name <laughs> joke. Okay. Mm. How does it compare with like uh, uh -oh. is that a mind block? <laughs> with, with some of the other IDEs. Idle is probably the most prevalent IDE. I mean, other than right. like Emacs and Vim, as far as Python, and that's strictly because of the development environment. But uh, you can use PyDev and Eclipse. You can yeah, use other Eclipse, various so environments. Eclipse. Yeah, so compared with Eclipse, Eclipse. Well, that's better functionality. Well, it's part of Python. So if you if you have Python on a system, Idle is installed by default. So even my Chromebook has Idle on it it's inside somewhere. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, at this point, I am. On the Pi. That's why I transferred a file over there. Anybody have any question about that? You're on the Pi. I'm on. I'm. I'm actually SSH into the Pi. I'm. I'm working on the Pi. So you just use the default password with username Pi. Right. Pi and Raspberry. And let me grab a browser from over here. Now, I think the key to select mode is to not do it when you are uh, on the wrong screen. Mm. Yeah. What's your Twitter name? Omnitech Dev with capital O, capital D. So you've got app underscore t. Is that the API key to Twitter? Or is it yeah, Twitter refers to any app, any application talking to the API is an app. So it's your app. Mm -hmm. It's just terminology difference. So. so the app key that you put, or the API key that you put in Twitter, you're going to put in that right. config file right. under app key. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So here's where we were. 
set up your Twitter account and log in. Well, you, you guys, you got a new Wi-Fi, Bill. Or is that different? It's new. Yeah, that's a Triton net, though. You're not going to get that guy. Okay. The connection's a little bit all the way over there. You do have to provide a cell number, register the app, jump through all the hoops. When you create it, make sure you select read white, read write for permissions and wait for acknowledgement. And we'll talk about the API key and secret here in a few minutes. Now when you jump on the Pi, a couple things you have to do up front. First thing you normally want to do is an update, sudo app get update. There is a pip utility that comes with Python for loading Python packages. So you install python-pip. <coughs> that is a typo, it's P-Y-T-H-O-N. And then you want to install Twyton. This is the library in Python that gives you access to the Twitter API. And here's that program I was just working on. We'll get Philly's in here in a minute. Whatever you want to call it, tweet your pie. You import from the Twyton library. The main, the main class, which is Python. There are four tokens you need, which we'll cover here in a minute. The program itself, you instantiate a Twython instance with those four parameters. App key, app secret, auth token, and auth secret. And then this is how you send a tweet. Tweet.update status. Status equals and whatever string you want to use. How long did this string? Would you like me to move off whenever you put passwords in? Um, I can. It's no big deal. No, I, I don't use it for anything else. I don't really care. I don't have any followers on this. I wouldn't use my real account for play. Oh that way. man, I was trying to follow you and I can't find you. How do I follow you? Uh, I don't know. I don't do Twitter. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was Omnitech Dev, though, right? Yeah, I'm not Omnitech Dev, and I can't find it. What? That's kind of weird. But he does. He does. He has that default uh, icon, right? Isn't it that? Thing? Well, he can't do. He can't do the app yet. But he's just trying to follow you and get your tweets. Mm -hmm. so he can fill his connect, with, connect with you. Words of wisdom from tonight's show. Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe that's it. Yeah. Omnitech Yeah, that's it. Okay. See, that's mine. Now I went Omnitech Dev. Yeah, Omnitech Development. Oh, we have two followers. The other one. <laughs> Who the heck is that? <laughs> Portuguese, it looks like. <laughs> oh, I know what happened. Rafa Kwanda. When I created this Twitter account this afternoon, you have to choose five followers before you can do anything with it now. Oh. So I just picked the first five on the list and then went in and unfollowed them. How do you choose five followers when you're creating an account? It's like, how do you? Well, it gives you a list. I just pick five. Or somebody to follow you. And then the first thing, it took me about five minutes to find that, and then I went and unfollowed it. But whoever this outfit is here apparently has an auto follow. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a bunch of other Omnitechs online, <laughs> especially on Twitter. So. That's because nobody has a trademark. Mm -hmm. Nobody can have the trademark. Because there are too many out there? No. Because there is a there was an Omnitech in the Far East 20 years ago that filed a Class 9 trademark on the on the name and then went out of business. Mm -hmm. So nobody else can get a trademark. It's because it's been filed. Right, because it's been filed. <laughs> Even though the organization filed it, it's been gone for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Anyway, was it last? there's a Twitter account. So let's go back to the pie. Finish this up. Oh, 
Okay, let me have that open over here. Somebody please call oh. Okay. So and that the app key goes in here. <laughs> well, please do. Otherwise, I'm a Sarah the screen for too long. It's like a. What about managed API? There it is. I would see you do this stuff a lot more than I do. Has everybody memorized that now? <laughs> it's it's all it's all right. It's up on YouTube now. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It won't it won't be good in a half an hour after we leave here because somebody on YouTube will have changed it. Yep. <laughs> Probably yes. Right. So now this host and hanging out and create the token. Token actions. Token, isn't that a character in South Park? <laughs> it's a very prevalent term from the 1970s. <laughs> token X, is, is there anything else that I'm going to put in Token X? So that's the oath. Mm -hmm. Token secret. Do you name the, the variables in, in, uh, in this program here? No, that's what they're, we they're just passed straight in right there. Right yeah, there. it's a yeah, straight so pass. I mean, use exactly the same nomenclature as Twitter. So you don't get yourself confused. It's totally right. Uh, yeah, yeah, we don't use logic here. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it takes all the fun out of it. You use the same term. Ah, okay. Let's the trick is to change the spell in the visual script. Mm -hmm. well, do you might know what the problem is? What problem? So it's syntax error. On the, From on the, on the status equals. On the status equals. 
on the tweet line that, that yeah I see a problem uh, you need to double quote because you have a single quote in there. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I need to escape a single quote. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, the next line up. I'm about to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, that's simpler. Instead of trying to find a single quote on it's English It's keyboard. actually a, you double quote it, and um, then you slice it out. Oh, that looks better, doesn't it? All right. Uh, at, you need aptitude install your Python dash pip. Python install that. Just gonna search for that and I'll find it. Gonna type on. Yeah. Python pip is not spelled that. Dyslexia is. Plasticia. Mm -hmm. no, Still not right. Getting closer, but not quite. <laughs> they're not picking on you. They're just backseat typing. That's fine. There you go. I, I never, I never profess to be an accurate typer. I'm a fast typer. Because usually I can type something and correct it three times before somebody else can type it right. It's nothing like having a dozen people sitting here watching you type. <laughs> and laughing, and laughing, yes. No problem. It's not blazingly fast, but I mean, like I say, I, I use uh, one of the other issues with the ARM architecture is there is no good emulator for ARM because you can't get enough memory to make it worthwhile. And what about running one of the faster ones like um, uh, um, the Hummingboard? Is it is the Hummingboard code compatible with the uh, Raspberry? I mean, board. Well, it, so the Raspberry has two binary blobs. One of them is getting put into public domain now. Mm -hmm. But the Raspberry Pi was actually very proprietary, and that's why it was hard to emulate. So it actually uses the grass graphic processor chip to bootstrap the install and startup of the ARM processor. So somebody else's tiny single board computer is not likely to be Raspberry compatible. Um, it's the, the VGA chip is really, not the VGA, but the, the graphics chip is really what was the proprietary part. So, but if somebody could, could license it, they could build no, it. It's, they're already in the process oh, they're, they're of licensing. opening it. Oh, okay. It's just that time to market didn't, that was a lower priority. Mm -hmm. Getting millions of kids around the world a computer to play with was the, the time to market goal. I assume the people at the public headquarters have. Well, we have massive quantities of pies. I was thinking, uh, if one of them could do a build faster than yeah. the rest No, of I did play with uh, doing a virtualized environment with, um, you can you can only go up to 2 gig of RAM, though. Yeah. That's so, awesome. um, but you do have to basically throw in a new kernel module just to do it. So it does it does work. You gotta, <laughs> you'd be using some pretty bleeding edge versions of Kimu, which was, I, already, I was already running them, so. Yeah, because the standard uh, QEMU, you're limited to a quarter gig, 256 meg. Yeah, but it's this kernel module that for the ARM that locks it at that. So, so they will have a developmental Pi someday. I'm sorry? So they will have a, a development Super Pi that we could be able to use to build faster someday. No, you can do it today. You can you can run a Pi in a virtualized environment, the Pi image, but a limited RAM. With two gig of RAM as the cap at the moment. 
you have to do a lot of leading edge stuff. Okay. Yeah. But even if you have it, the performance is a tenth of what you have on hardware. So you don't get the speed. You don't get the speed. Well, in my experience. But you can just cross compile and get it anyway. So it's, you can get the speed out of an x86 if you want. Oh. You just tell GCC what platform. So that really works. works. Okay. Yeah. So we'll try that one. Okay, while we're discussing, I did the uh, pip install for Twypon, which is the main library packaging here. And let's see if that works. Nope. No. Hmm? Should be there. Yeah, but you could have threw you could have threw a print in there to show you it was working. Three right here. Cool. Very popular. You can see the tweet right there to your right. That's what you just tweeted right there. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So obviously there are other ways to play with us. You know, you can drop in another string from the command line. You can do prints. You can do you know, even log stuff. Uh, so basically that's how you tweet your pipe. And in theory, that'll work on any Linux system. Mm -hmm. All you need is a Python library. Except for Red Hat 5. <laughs> <laughs> Just to play your tweet. <laughs> so can you go to Twitter and find the tweets of your followers? Mm -hmm. or, or those you're following? Um, via the API? Yeah. Yes. So, for example, like you have a website and you want to have everybody that's following you, what they're tweeting about, you actually have that as a block in the website via the API. So, why is my tweet not showing up for that? Maybe, you need to re maybe Lee needs to refresh it more. Uh -huh. refresh. See the tweets thing over there? Mm -hmm. Well, wait, uh, you tweeted about his? I replied to his tweet. Okay. Lee is looking on as a um, generic user at the moment, I believe. No, go to the tech dev here. What I'm saying is you may need to approve his reply as your actual user. How would I do that? So oh, there we are. I saw three messages I sent to you. Can you hear me now? That was my first one. Then the next one's above it. Okay. Having fun and tweeting across the table. <laughs> now, let me ask a really dumb Twitter, Twitter question. <laughs> Would his tweets, since they were prefaced with that Omnitech dev, go out to all his followers too? His followers would see his tweet, yes. Even, even if they're prefaced with Omnitech Dev? That, yeah. that is part of the body of the tweet. Okay. Yeah, so people yeah. that, yeah, if they select that, they'll, they'll see the at Omnitech Dev you know, tweet stream and then they can follow you. Right. But they have to follow Lee to see the fir his first tweet? Well, as, as long as the tweet is public, they can see it. So how would I make? Do I do I have to prove oh, somebody else has tweeted? Oh. <laughs> uh -huh. 
Cool. All right. More advanced topics, which I shall leave as an exercise for the user. Mm -hmm. Things like uh, uh, you know, using a smart host, so if you email forward with Google or Gmail or whatever other internal mail server you have. We deal with it all the time. It is a very problematic issue and not, not a waste of time. But it, you can almost never justify the time to set up an individual mail server because of all the hoops you have to jump through. Especially since unless you're running DNS, getting reverse DNS can be next to impossible. With How many of you guys are familiar with what a smart host is? How many of you want to know what it is? <laughs> okay, uh, a smart host is just a authenticated SMTP server. So like, for example, you have a whole bunch of machines and they need to send email. And if they don't really need to have their own account, you can actually have a SMTP server out there that you can actually have them log into and send as a relay. But they have to authenticate. And so it's basically a smart mail host. It's not an open relay, it's a relay. Yeah, it, but it's, it's a smart SMTP host, but in the mail world, they shorten it and just call it a smart host. Yeah, so it's, it, it's done all the fiery hoops of reverse DNS and MX record and all that stuff so that, it, yeah, other people who are going to receive the email. Yeah. ISP. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. But sure. what, what you'll find is in the enterprise, you'll have some application that needs to send emails on behalf of the user, for right. example. And in the configuration settings, it will say smart host, server address, username, password. And that's it, it does. It looks just like an ISP account. But um, its its purpose is to relay mail. Go ahead. What's the difference no. between a smart SMTP host or server and just an SMTP server? Is there a differentiation there? An SMTP server is meant to relay mail along with just uh, SM, simple mail transfer protocol. A smart host actually allows somebody to authenticate to it and send mail on behalf of other users. It's, okay. It's it, 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 it without the username and password, it could be very dangerous. Okay. Yeah, it, it, if, if, you, if you were not using, if that smart host were not authenticated, it'd be an open relay. Okay. Open relay is let you send mail as anybody. Or let anybody send, well, it let you send let mail. Anybody as send anybody. mail through that mail server. As, as anybody. anybody. Uh, historically, <laughs> it's, you know, the most common practice is to restrict users to the internal subnet, which means only hosts with an IP address within that subnet definition can use the mail server. Which means then if you're using Gmail as your SMTP host, you'd have to be inside the Gmail subnet. Right. Or if you build one, you have to be inside your office subnet. <laughs> uh, I set a lot of them up that way because external users can be a nightmare. And it's an easy way to restrict external users. Right, it's an easy way to restrict access. <clears throat> but uh, unfortunately, that means you've got one email server that can be used for outbound email. What if you're traveling? You know, you typically want to be able to travel and have your email go out through your company mail server so the return address and authentication comes from the company. That way somebody, you know, when you send an email, if I send an email to Andrew as Omnitech and it says, and it says uh, Gmail host in the headers, then obviously he's not going to be very impressed with our mail server configuration. <laughs> not that people would know to look for it. But the, base, the basic point is if you have an email server, Using it to send email has to be restricted. You know, if, if it's one you set it for a service for business, you can restrict them to IP, but then that blocks outside users. So typically you set up authentication, like Gmail uses, where you use three or four different ways to authenticate. Uh, the only problem with that is if you don't use SASL or, uh, what's the other one, Andrew? Uh, SSL over, well, there's TLS. TLS. You know, there's two ways to encrypt the actual email conversation. If you're doing remote authentication, you do not want to use plain text. Because if somebody were to get in the middle and sniff that traffic, they'd have an email password. So during the handshake of the SMTP traffic, you do want to make sure that that's <coughs> encrypted. So that's one of the things, is configuring the system. For example, you have a server back in your environment and it has no internet access. 
but it still is handling a plain text user name and password. So you want the handshake for the authentication to be encrypted, and that's where TLS authentication comes in. Yep. And what I am doing right now is switching to the other SD card. And I will show you another Raspberry Pi boot sequence. This is the second card I had set up. Now this one's readable. <laughs> <laughs> you can uh, go into Grub and set the boot parameter and make it bigger, but I usually don't. <laughs> Is that full zoom in? Huh? I'm just trying to get it down below the top there. Yeah. So you can see the whole thing. Shy of a silly string. Mm -hmm. Did you focus? I'm sorry? Did you focus it? I. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, that's much better. Sort of slightly better. And it's all now. I would still say for the people in the back that you could pull that back so you lever it for you. Oh, hang on a second. I'm going to launch the GUI here. Yeah, once we get the GUI going, it'll be controllable. I mean, we could do it from the command line, but I don't want to pull what's trying to change the font size yet. And one thing we really do need to do is encourage people to sit up in the front of the class. Yeah. Ooh, a logo. Your previous life where you wouldn't know as much. <laughs> if you search for the term Gringo Malvado, I'm the number one result. The evil you know. foreigner. <laughs> okay, so accessory. Is this that same distribution? Yes. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm not sure why this didn't come up. Oh, I know what it is. I'm not logged in as Pi. I logged in as me. How did I know? Oh, that's why you didn't get the icons. And all that. Right. That's why I didn't get the desktop icon. Everybody catch that? Yeah. And let's see. Let's get a that's your foreground here. Sweet mom. Why is the string a screen? <laughs> hmm? No, the screen, the uh, string. <laughs> well, move your console, move your shells terminal over to the left. Yeah. <laughs> That's farther away. <laughs> is, is that big enough for folks? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Oh, that's even better. How's that? Uh, well, this is a different program. Okay, this is one of the other examples. This oh, okay, is so you get a different app key for every app. Okay. okay. The streamer. Where's my cursor? Uh, okay. Um, this is the other side. This is the other type of app. This one actually will monitor Twitter on a regular basis. To do that, you need a few more resources. You need things like time. This is how, or by the way, I don't know if we mentioned it in the past, but 
the main programming language for non-kid stuff, or even for kid stuff, but the main real programming language on Raspberry Pis is Python. So most of, this, most of the good libraries out there exist in Python. Recently become the most prominent programming language in the world. Yep. Well. Now, if you only put curly braces in it, then I like it. Sorry? <laughs> Anyway, I wonder if your insertion point is below the bottom of the screen. You changed the font, it might have I mean, the changed window. your height. I mean, I can't you see the bottom edge of the window. need to resize the window. Yeah, I still can't see the bottom. Still can't see the bottom. Uh, I can't. So I have a Anyway, pager works now. So, language Python, we're looking at time. Uh, this particular example, again, from SparkFun, you can just go there and look for them. They've got 30 or 40 different projects you can build with a pack. One of the, one of the guys is a, a Heimel, I think his name is, and he walks around in a lab coat. You know, everybody's everybody's taking lab coats nowadays. <laughs> but you know, he, he's he's kind of good. You know, he takes people from the start, building the SD card on up through the Tweeter Pi was number two. This is a further down advanced one. But the point of this one is to allow you to do something on the GPIO pins if a particular hashtag comes across Twitter, comes across your Twitter account. So for that, you need time. This a timing loop. You need a GPIO, GPIO library to allow you to access the GPIO pins on a card. So you can set a light, turn on an alarm or whatever. And Python Streamer is what you use to monitor Twitter. In this case, pin 22 is an easy one to find on the header. It's used for a lot of different applications. Here's all the app keys and secrets that the guys were using in their application. They're not mine. <laughs> and here's how you set up the callback. We're defining a class called Blinky Streamer. Are you in view? If the text you want is in the data. Python streamer, when he pulls something back, it triggers his on success method. And if data includes the text string that you're searching for, it'll print it. It will turn on the LED, sleep for half a second, and then turn it off. So it'll blink the LED for half a second and turn it off. And here's how you set up the GPO. You set up the mode. And then here's the, way, here's the, you know, the instantiation of that blinky streamer. And it does work. Basically, you try and return. Keep trying and return. Uh, I don't want to take the time to explain the code, but the example is pretty good, and what's your work? Any questions? So, do you have an LED on the? I didn't. I didn't bring one. Uh, the one minor issue I have with uh, with these. Is there's no easy way to put hardware on it? You know, when it, all of the exercises are made, you, you you plug in a header and you hang your protoboard next to it. Yeah, but it'll print, right? I mean. Yeah, yeah, it'll, it'll so, print. So that thing will compile and run. So uh, will it run against your account? No, because oh. those aren't my keys. Okay. Right. You, 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 you could, could change the keys out and do it. Yes. Yeah, I could change out keys and do it. Okay. 
Um, I, I, could say I think you can, you can use an old right. floppy cable as a standoff out of it. Well, but the point is, you, you got you got two things floating around. I'm sorry. You you got two things floating around on a table, which makes it ugly. No, I, I'm, 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 we're not yeah. disagreeing. We were yeah. we were saying that blinky LED awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what I what I what I have done in the past, and you know, for the SRMs, I take a header. I take three wires off the header and solder them to the pins with resistors of the temperature sensor. And I just stick it out the side of the case. It works. It's not too open. It's only moderately ugly. Only moderately ugly. Moderate. Anyway, let me jump back and talk about one more app here. which is really cool. Unfortunately, it's the one that blew up this afternoon, so I can't show you too much on it except the, uh, except the overview. Penetration testing is used a lot by security people. Basically, it's a way to use various online tools to test the security of a system. It's also used by malicious hackers to try and crack or hack into systems. Although, I mean, there's so many different bad guys out there from 10 year old script kitty sending spam to you know, people that are actually working for a nation trying to hack things. Uh, but anyway, the point is penetration testing is a methodology and a Pi gives you all the tools that you need with this Arch Assault system. It's based on Arch Linux. Uh, there's more than one of them out there. The thing I liked about Arch Assault was it had, it had good documentation. It seems to have the best documentation for the system. It has a very good detailed installation procedure for dropping it on a Pi. And if you look at the Arch Assault website, which I'll show you in a minute, it has a pretty extensive list of packages. I've actually got an SD card and installed it on this afternoon. Unfortunately, I spent an hour downloading six gig worth of packages that blow out to about 16 gig on the system. And it got all the way down to the end and said corrupt package. So the concept itself is fairly simple, although you do it is multi-step. The first thing you do is install the ARM6 Arch Linux, which gives you the base OS install. And here's the one for a Pi, Arch Linux ARM, Platforms ARM6 Raspberry Pi. The next, you know, writing the card, uh, we talked about that before. It's really not that complicated, depending on your device. If you increase the block size, it may save you some speed. I just start it, jump off to another window, and do something else, come back half an hour later, it's done. Lee, when you say Arch install as the best documentation, you mean the best documentation for setting up a, a Raspberry Pi? Right. Well, and Pi, it seems to be the, the best on website that three or four looked at. There was one other one I mentioned here. Uh, I guess I didn't mention here. Oh, it, it's later on. There are so there's a pwm.py, and but looking at the arch arch assault. Did you say pwm? Pwm, I think. It's just pwn. Pwn. Pwn pi. Pwn pi. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, my my criteria was I looked at them. 
if I could find the Pi installed within a minute from the web page, that's where I went. And that's why I like Arch Assault. It seemed to be the most active, too, because their current release, they, it looks like you do a release at least twice a year. That seemed to be fairly active. But the point is, you, ins you download the installer for Arch Linux, ARM6. You burn the SD card. Again, the problem, the only problem with that is that they're all 2GIG. Most of the default images are 2GIG. And if you want the entire pen test suite from Arch Assault, it's 16GIG. So hopefully you've got a newer version of uh, G uh, part, it, part Ed, because the version on my system is about a year old and it, it choked on the EXT4. Okay. I would show it installed, but uh, you know it's past 8:30. We're doing, you know, we're, we're kind of pushing a little long on time. Uh, I tell you what, I will go ahead and reboot it while I leave you with some closing notes here. I'll throw Arch Linux on here. Questions? Yes. Basic question about um, pen testing. So, like, I've got Pi that has the software on it. What's an example of like how I would use it to penetration test? Okay. Let's just say you have like a web application, okay, and it has an API or something, or, or you have a server with an email service on it. Penetration testing is basically testing to see if there are any known faults active, okay. And then maybe you start doing password attacks, like brute force, or, or checking for default passwords. You know, is the password a password? Um, penetration testing is a lot of things. Um, yeah. But it's, it's all checking, checking the known exploits first will usually find you an open hole. So that's, that's kind of a fun thing. So you have some old legacy system that's been running for eight years straight. You run your penetration test, and some exploit that has never been patched will probably let you do some fun things very fast. Okay. Good. Um, sometimes people will do a class, and they'll set up something with a known exploit, and then they'll challenge the students to try to find something. Okay. What's the first? What's the first? Yeah. So if you use it without authorization, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. they'll collect two hundred dollars. So if you build a do icky for for sale and use a ra Raspberry Pi, you know, as mm -hmm. the innards, is the fact that it's based on Raspberry Pi does that have you know commercial value, additional like you know value to it? Um, to there, there's some customers? perceived replaceability, some perceived continuity. So, for example, if, if you have a product that's built in Raspberry Pi, you know that you can get this a replacement product very fast versus a custom embedded board. Yeah. Or, or a Google board or something like that that nobody recognizes the name for. Well, there, there is some name recognition because <coughs> it, is a, it, is a sense, it is a non profit <coughs> project. It has been around for what, three years now? Something like that. Oh, a very short amount of time in, main, in mainstream. But there's a lot of people using them in visible projects. You know, they're designed for education. They come and go. You can run Scratch on them. You put a two-year-old in front of them. There's a lot, of, and almost every two-year-old today knows knows how to use a mouse. So, you know, it's something they can use right away. So there is name recognition. And they've been. They've got some high-profile projects. They've been sent to the space station. They've been sent to. Um, on underwater explorations yeah. by so many people. Yeah, they, they are well recognized. Uh, as you say, the form factor leaves a little bit to be desired. So the B plus, you know, is is a good improvement there. Although it's brand new and the and the case options haven't followed up. Actually, uh, it approved a couple companies have put case options out today already. Yeah, but I mean, the you know, unless it's a not a play case. In other words, I'm waiting for Syntech to do it. OK. Well, I mean, you might be surprised with what was released this week alone. Mm -hmm. Quite a lot of people had some pre-availability, and right. they got some yeah, nice it's been in a, it's, 
it's been in the dev pipe for a while. Okay, any questions? Pizza. Sounds like a good plan to me. Should anyone decide to attend the after meeting meeting, which has absolutely nothing to do with this meeting, but it can be a good time? Uh, we're heading to Nick and Elena. Does anybody not know how to get there and want to go? It's on Woodson, uh, down some. Actually, uh, if I could have about 10 minutes of your time, I'd like to talk about the Beagle Bone real quick. Sure. Um, can I have your HDMI plug, please? I can do that. By the way, this is Arch Linux. Not much to show, but it's basically <laughs> all command line driven. So I was so very fortunate. <laughs> I was very fortunate to be able to buy RC, which is the awesome one. And I was playing with it one day, and I decided to use my Chromebook as the power source. How many of you guys have used a Chromebook? Yeah. yeah. So the bigger one that's an ARM7 or ARM6? Well, here, we'll, we'll just take a look at it here. Because the BeagleBone software stack is pretty impressive. Is it a, is it a competitor to Pi? Or is it, a it predates Pi by quite a bit of time. This particular thing is the last evolution of it. And I mean, they put, I think they put like 500 on sale. This is completely open source, and they can only build so many at a time. It's a very, there's pretty much no profit at all. Um, so I got one of these things, and I was going to play with it. I was going to use my Chromebook as a power source source for playing with it one day. And so I plugged it in, and it was it was neat because it kind of brought up a. In my Chromebook, recognized it as a storage device. Let me get this window over here. Get over there. Go. Go. Recognized as a storage device, and it popped up the little file menu. Yeah. So I'm on a Chromebook, you know, no hacking, no nothing, just a Chromebook. And so that was really neat. And so I opened up the little documentation, read me and start, and it's showing me how all the little stuff works. So, so that's the documentation. It's in the file system. Yeah, so this is yeah. in the file system. As you can see right up there on the uh, top left hand side. But you know what? They just had to make it a little bit more awesome. Mm -hmm. So you kind of scroll down, and, and all of a sudden it says, Click here to launch. So I'm on a Chromebook, and I'm like, really? So here is the BeagleBone Black via the USB that's powering it and doing the file share for storage also throws up a network interface that the kernel in the Chromebook recognizes and starts up. <laughs> and over the USB. Over the USB. Yeah. And so I'm sitting here, and I'm like, you know what? This is pretty nice. This is fun. <laughs> And then I'm like, what's this Cloud9 IDE? And I'm like, oh, wow, I have an IDE now. I can type and, you know, play with it, play with the whole server. Oh, wow. <laughs> now, does, it, does it run a full kernel, Andrew? Boy, well, I don't know. Let's see. It's running kernel 3.8.13. Okay. So, which, which you can't do with a lot of microcontrollers like Arduinos. You know, it didn't... Well, this so, so, so an Atmel chip, which is you, you theoretically on like a, uh, one of the larger Atmels, you can run an original 16-bit version of the kernel. Right. But who wants to run a 16-bit version of Linux these days? You know. So it's just basically your own compiled program, which is a fun topic I should bring up right now. I don't know if you guys have heard about this. Flappy Bird is the Flappy Bird game rewritten in assembly 16-bit <laughs> and can be ran from a floppy drive as the operating system on raw hardware. Oh my. I love the internet. <laughs> Does not require operating Yeah, so basically, yeah, basically you can just put put it on something and just run it as a raw operating system, and it will basically run a 16-bit uh, system. But beside that, 
the Cloud9 IDE, for example, on the, the BeagleBone here has all kinds of Python programming IDE built into a web browser mm -hmm. to the point where you actually have these debugger things over here and, and some other fun, you know, toys. So it's really great. You can just literally write everything straight from the web browser. So from a kid point, from a kid training point of view, the Chromebook that their schools are using, it just plugged in and worked. So, you know, this is this has you know HDMI and it has all the features. It has a slightly different processor. Let's see here, where's it? What does that go for? 89 MSRP. What, this? 90 bucks. Mm -hmm. yeah. MSRP. This one, no, you, the problem is you can't, they're sold out every time they go on sale. Mm -hmm. so, it's it's kind of it's going black or Vision C is here for $55. Yeah, I only yeah. paid 50 yeah, something paid for it. So, but it's on back order, so. Well, if you get a back order, then you'll get it, right? You have to get the truck and get it online. If you wait until they're available, you will get it. Somebody else will get it. Yeah. So it's estimated ship date August 1st. That's not bad. That isn't bad. That's, That's not bad. It's real close. Yeah. Sometimes it takes it that long just to ship it to you, even if they do that work stuff. So, yeah, I have a revision C. So the difference here that's big is that the processor is a 1 gigahertz versus your, your 700 um, megahertz. It has a 512 meg of RAM, but it has a 4 gig flash built straight into the system. So you don't need to use a micro SD card, but there's a spot for it if you want it. With Debian pre-installed. Like. Yeah, and it runs Debian pre-installed. Um, you've got, you know, the USB host, USB client. You've got your 46-pin GPIOs. Um, Tons of other fun things. Um, if you can get one of these, they're like really, really, really nerdy toys. But yeah, you can run down to Micro Center and get a Raspberry Pi really easy. This is harder to get. Yeah. Harder to get, but hopefully, you know. And one of the things that we mentioned earlier is that there's a lot of competitors trying to hit that market, which is great for us consumers. But the parts, if they're using the same parts, will be sucked up in different places. Yeah, it, I mean, it's going to create some problems, but there is going to be the race to the bottom. It's going to benefit us. We're going to be able to buy all kinds of little toys to control things in our house, and the women are going to think we're stranger than normal. I have a question. It says, get started on development in less than five minutes with a single USB cable. Uh, how does it take five minutes from what you described? Um, <laughs> I'm That's assuming awesome. they want people to read the full paragraph. Oh, no. <laughs> they just plug it in and land it. Or if they wrote They're one minute, long people long. might not believe it. Okay, less than five. It is less than five. Mm -hmm. Instantaneous is less than. Five. Yeah, and I mean you can via the Cloud Nine. You can just um, put your code in, and then you can you can run it, uh, pause it, do all kinds of other things. <laughs> <coughs> so that's why I just wanted to show you guys that the pi, the Pi A, the Pi B, the Pi Compute, the Pi B Plus, the um, what was it? The Hummingbird you said, the QB board, the Banana board, which is for PC Duino. PC Duino is a good one. It actually, has two systems on it. And and there's some <coughs> not necessarily. Older, but there's a lot more offerings in the industrial space. EMAC out of Carbondale, Illinois, has been doing SPCs for years, <coughs> forever. Uh, in fact, we, they donated one to us three or four years ago when I bought one. Uh, you know, I was going to do it, you know, do do a SIG, but we didn't have any interest in it. But the, it runs a full kernel. It's a you know precursor to the Raspberry Pi, but it's in that same hundred and two hundred dollar price range like the BeagleBone. It's a commercial development. I'm sorry, right. this is fifty bucks. Oh, that's just hundred. Some of those hundred ninety. No, so eighty nine yeah. was the list price. Okay. Well, eighty nine is the list price because they're not they don't make enough. Yeah. But it includes I O on the card, analog and digital I O on the card. Which one? Emac. Okay. So the PC one. Duino has an Arduino and a Linux box in the same card. 
Okay. Which is interesting. Now, are the form factors all different for these yes. various groups? So you need, if you're going to get cases. Well, so what's going on is a lot of them are going to start standardizing on some four hole pattern. Okay? Yeah. I haven't gotten a B to measure it yet, but I'm sure it's close. So you're going to start seeing some type of a uh, standard. Um, <clears throat> and it's maybe the, the cases will have, you know, obviously where the ports are would be different. But to mount this to a project board, to have it connected to something yeah. else, so is going to become extremely. Um, so here's somebody playing with a banana board. What are they doing here? The banana pie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, a Chinese, that's like a pie. That's though. a Chinese clone, right? Okay, yeah, it's a Chinese clone, but the feature, I, I forgot what it was. So it has some remote power switches and some other headers for fun things. It has a SATA port on the side. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. That's perfect. Yeah, so. Which, which, which makes it a lot nicer for XBMC. Yeah, um, so you can get the QB board, which has almost the exact same features and has SATA on it. Um, there's just a ton of stuff out there. The home and, board also. And I think the benefit is is that you know within a year, you're going to be able to buy <coughs> pretty much whatever you want for 20 bucks. So, and guess what? That's where the Internet of Things is going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's and, and factor number two. There aren't going to be any Windows developers out there. <laughs> Too damn